Good evening and welcome to another edition of Arroyo Live. From the Pasadena Media Center, I'm Joe Carbonetta. This program is produced by the Pasadena Media to help enrich the community through informative and meaningful conversation. Remember, you can share your questions or comments with us anytime at Arroyo Live at PasadenaMedia.org. Tonight, we have a special opportunity to gain some firsthand insight into the complex and busy world of our California State Senate. We'll talk with California State Senator Anthony Portentino and get his thoughts about the state's reopening in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Please join me for another edition of Arroyo Live. Joining me now is California State Senator Anthony Portentino. Uh, Senator Portentino, thank you for joining us this evening and welcome. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Uh, there's certainly a lot of questions that we'd like to uh, get into this evening, but the first one is, of course, to ask you to maybe tell our viewers at home a little bit more about yourself. Well, I represent the uh, 25th State Senate District, which runs from Sunland to Hunga all the way to Upland along the 210. So it's largely a foothill uh, suburban district in Los Angeles County. Upland is in San Bernardino County. So most of the cities uh, reside in uh, uh, Los Angeles County. Uh, proud to represent the district since 2016. Uh, originally born in New Jersey, came to California after college. And my wife and I have raised two wonderful daughters. Uh, in La Cunata, Flint Ridge, and one is 29 and one is 19, and uh, love my district and really uh, proud to serve uh, the constituents in California. You no, know, your schedule is always very, very busy, and uh, we really appreciate your taking a little bit of time to speak with us tonight. Um, the first topic of discussion is obviously the the reopening of the state uh, we've been here in california more or less locked down as a result of the covid 19 pandemic for uh, upwards of 15 months and uh, there is finally a bit of a light at the end of this tunnel and uh, we definitely like to to ask about your thoughts on uh, everything that has happened up till now where we are right now and and where we're going to be uh, hopefully going in the future well, I think like in California, and I'm you know pleased to see the state reopening and you know whatever the new normal is, you know pleased to to get back to it. Uh, you know, my wife and I went out to dinner and sat inside for the first time, and you know that was a, a an interesting experience. Like everybody else, you know, first we sat outside and then we sat inside. Uh, you know, we still try to practice our social distancing and and wear our masks when appropriate and. You know, like all other families were uh, on a, more Zoom calls than I think anybody thought was humanly possible and uh, had a daughter who uh, missed half of her senior year of high school, uh, like so many other kids in that generation, and then missed half of her uh, freshman year in college. Uh, so she was caught up in that 18, 19 year old group that uh, missed the, the special part of high school and the special part of college, which is that freshman experience. So, you know, we had to get through all of that, uh, like everybody else in, in, in California struggled through it. Um, but I'm pleased that the, you know, the Biden administration did a fantastic job with the vaccination rollout and see that the vaccination rates are getting to, to where we can go back to normal. Um, it's a shame that the, when the COVID, uh, crisis began, you know, 15 months ago that we didn't, uh, as a national approach, take it seriously. And uh, it's a shame that something as simple as a mask got politicized. Uh, I used to say that a, a mask isn't a political statement. It means you love your neighbor. Uh, it means you care about the people who are next to you. Um, and, I, you know, we should have been much more, as a country, uh, had leadership that was promoting good neighborship versus downplaying the the impact of the virus. I think you know, hundreds of thousands of people would have had their lives saved had we had different leadership uh, in the White House. And that's unfortunate. Um, but like every California, we're resilient people. We did our best. Uh, I think uh, California was the first to, to go to shut down and uh, again, had a few hiccups with the early vaccination rollout, but got those ironed out. I was pleased to go to the Magic Mountain vaccination site 
uh, with Supervisor Barger uh, and see how efficient that was running. I know Pasadena, with his own health department, did a fantastic job uh, with uh, through the pandemic, as 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 good as any city in the in the state. And so collectively, we got through this. Now we're going to go back, uh, hopefully in the fall, with schools on a regular schedule um, as more and more uh, folks get vaccinate, vaccinated and the numbers go up and the uh, health officials determine what's a safe threshold for kids and age groups. Um, so I think we all need to be optimists and I think we need to be good neighbors. And I think we need to recognize that the last 15 months have been unprecedented and a challenge for all of us. Uh, the mental health implications have been uh, significant for our kids. Early on in the pandemic, I did a mental health forum uh, with uh, four uh, family therapists to try to help families cope with the, the initial phase of the lockdown. Things like divorced parents sharing custody, how that was going to go through, uh, special needs kids, how they were handling the pandemic. And then in the later months of the pandemic, I did a town hall that was driven by teenagers, um, organized by teenagers, um, and talked about what topics that they wanted to talk about and had experts uh, on on the line to, to help them get through it. So I think you've seen the best of, of people during this pandemic uh, at the end. And I think uh, we're going to get through it the best we can. Well, you bring up mental health, and I know that's an, an issue that is one, one of the uh, issues, I suppose, that you champion. Um, and I would like to talk more about that in a moment. But uh, just a moment ago, also, you brought up education uh, when you were speaking of your daughter. Uh, and I know that that's also a, a, an issue that's near and dear to your heart. And uh, I would like to take a moment to talk about that because there's a lot of discussion that the last 15 months are sort of the lost year when it comes to education. There are concerns about how effective the, the education system has been uh, using Zoom meetings and, or I shouldn't say Zoom, but that type of, of uh, meeting distance. system, yeah, <laughs> distance learning. Uh, what do you say to that, that, it, that it's a lost year? Uh, and what are your concerns? Well, I think like any parent, we all want the best for our kids. You know, we all do. Uh, and I don't, I don't fault any parent for, for having that sense of frustration. You know, we also know that time goes by fast. Um, you know, our, our children age faster than we'd like them to age. And we want them to have age appropriate education. And there's no question that the distance learning has been a different experience than in class learning. Um, and some kids have thrived on it and some kids haven't. And some schools have done it better than others. And uh, some teachers have, have used the tools to be more efficient. You know, when you're in, you know, middle school and upper grades, um, so the, the challenges are across the board. The, the social aspect of it, I think, is probably uh, more problematic. You know, kids uh, not being with their friends, not learning how to socialize. I mean, we already had a, a generation that was more digital um, and was more comfortable emailing and texting than they were talking to each other. And I think those socialist aspects of it have been exacerbated much more so than the academics. You know, we could always teach more. And you can always catch up academically. But the, the social issues, to me, as a parent, uh, just my opinion, just empirically, to me, those are greater challenges. Um, I did hear a wonderful story about a 13-year-old a who, when her school went back for the first day, was mortified about going back to school because uh, during the, the, the 14 months of the pandemic, she had developed acne. And she hadn't done it gradually. It just sort of came on and she was afraid to go to school and see her peers with acne. And she had a, you know, words with her mother that morning about how she didn't want to go to school. And then in the afternoon, she came home and she was all full of smiles and all bright because she had, had loved being with her friends. And the mother goes, well, what about, you know, the situation you were concerned about this morning? And the daughter said, all my friends had acne, too. And so being around her friends comforted her with her anxiety of, of developing acne during the, during the pandemic. And so there's no substitute. When I visited uh, schools throughout the district as they were starting to open up, I would ask the kids how they felt to be back with their peers. And that peer-to-peer -peer relationships has amazing and enormous healing qualities for our kids. So the social aspect gives me the most consternation because those are hard lessons to, hard habits to break. Uh, 
you know, digital world has its pluses, but it does keep us separate. And I, I'm concerned about a generation of kids not learning how to play, not learning how to interact, not learning how to high five, not, you know, not being with their peers, struggling, overcoming, you know, all of those things that our kids need at, during their formative years. So that's why, to me, th those are the bigger challenges, I think, as we go back is creating a sense of normal and comfort and, and joy and, and create that environment to then let the, the in-person learning uh, fill their minds with all of the things they need to, to learn. There have been calls within uh, various communities, uh, largely coming from parents, but some officials as well, uh, asking for what amounts to a do over as far as the, the previous school year is concerned. There are concerns that the education model was not very effective, especially with regards to some of the younger children who really lack the focus and, and self-motivation to concentrate on school when they are not in a school surrounding. Uh, what do you say to those people? You know, I think parents should have that option. Um, uh, definitely. Uh, I don't have a problem uh, with children wanting to repeat a grade or repeat classes. And I think school districts need to be flexible to accommodate uh, some of those concerns because those are legitimate concerns. Um, you know, I, you know, I wonder how effective my daughter's freshman year classes were. She got decent grades. And, you know, when we picked her up at the end of the semester, um, she was talking a lot about her classes. So, you know, like all parents, I'm hoping it's stuck. Um, you know, her, her school was closed during the first semester of her freshman year, but then they did a, a compact uh, second semester. They opened up the dorms, but they still had classes online. Um, so I'm hopeful that, you know, she got what she needed to get. Um, but I, you know, like every parent, I want to see how she does when she goes back to in-person learning in the fall. Um, but I, you know, I think parents should have that ability to, to be flexible. We love our kids. You know, every parent wants the best for their third graders and their fifth graders. And, and we know our kids and, you know, parents can sense if their kids thrived or if their kids were challenged or if their kids need uh, to repeat. And I think, you know, school districts should be open to that conversation. Is there a general concern that we may see uh, more difficulties for students uh, that have had to deal with the pandemic as we move forward? Uh, do we do you foresee some period in the future where students that were forced to do the distance learning uh, may struggle later on in their school careers? You know, I think it's anything else in life. You're going to see some kids who adapt easier than others. Um, but again, to me, I think the, the social aspect has the potential of having a more systemic harm. I think the academic piece can be overcome. You know, smart people are going to adjust. Uh, people who need help hopefully will get the remediation and the tutoring and the opportunity to, to, to repeat. You know, so I think the system should take care of the academic, the learning loss piece of it. And I know the governor has budgeted significant resources to help school districts deal with learning loss. Uh, as a parent, and maybe this is the difference between my wife and I, you know, she looks over the test. I ask my daughter how she's feeling, you know, uh, uh, just the 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 emotional piece to me, I think, has more of a, a long term systemic potential problems than the, the learning loss, I think, can be overcome. Well, sort of changing gears here, uh, one of the topics that has made headlines recently in, in media circles is the slowdown in the rate of vaccinations here in the state of California. Uh, actually, we're seeing that slow down nationwide, um, but we've had great success here recently in California with uh, numbers trending downward, uh, certainly a positive aspect. And as the state begins to reopen, uh, what, what are the concerns and the challenges that we face in terms of getting more people to not only start the vaccination process, but there are a, a large number of people who have stopped the vaccination process after only the first shot? Well, I think, I, again, I, I hate to say it, but I think you've seen a politi politicization of science and vaccinations. I mean, herd immunity works. Um, we have to get ahead of the variants. We have to make sure that our populations uh, are vaccinated so uh, they are immune to the to the virus in the 90 percent. 
And the fact that we have news programs uh, where you have news, you know, not necessarily hard new opinion columnists or opinion personalities downplaying the importance of vaccinations. Uh, you know, there was just a sports figure that talked about, you know, his values don't, you know, he doesn't want to give up his values by getting a vaccination. And so my question is, so are your values not to care about your neighbors? You know, are your values not to care about the, the kid down the street? You know, that's that's not a value that's being selfish. I mean, if you have a medical reason not to get a vaccination, that's one issue. But if you're doing it because you're watching a particular opinion news program where the host won't say whether they're vaccinated or you had a a, a person in the White House who secretly got vaccinated and didn't want to tell people that they got vaccinated because they want to politicize um, health and science and public health. I mean, that to me. That just makes me sad that you 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 shroud selfishness in, in a political statement. Um, so we have to get over that and we have to figure out a way to convince that, you know, 30 percent or 25 percent of the population, um, the the merit and the good neighborness, uh, the, the 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 human values of of appreciating how what we one person does affects the person next to us. You know, it's no different than opening a door for somebody. You open a door for somebody who's struggling with their packages because you're a good neighbor. Uh, you wear a mask because you care about your neighbor and you love your neighbor. You get vaccinated because you want to help California get back to normal and get back open. This notion that it's somehow this, you know, exhib exhibition of libertarianism is, is the opposite of good neighborism. And so we just need more people to promote uh, the importance and the public health. Now we have work to do because there is, you know, there are folks out there who are career skeptics um, and we have to be better in educating folks on the efficacy of why these vaccinations are important. And that's part of the role that we as leaders have to do. You mentioned the need for uh, motivation to find new ways to motivate uh, folks to to get vaccinated. I'm curious to know your position on the governor's approach, the, the vaccine lotteries and, and the giveaways. Well, I think everybody's looking to be creative. You know, uh, you, you everybody started with reason, you know, do it because it's sound and it's it's healthy and it's good policy, you know. Unfortunately, reason doesn't always win the day um, and leaders have to try to be creative. And there were other governors around the country who started with uh, with uh, sweepstakes and giveaways. And I think Governor Newsom is just trying anything. I mean, he wants the state open just as much as everybody who is a skeptic wants the state open. Uh, he's just trying to figure out a way to cajole and, and, and get people to take the vaccinations. And if if, if the lottery system works, so be it. If education works, so be it. If reason works, so be it. Um, you know, we, we have to get to herd immunity because we don't want the variants to come and bite us and take a stronghold in the state. Um, and I, I'm flabbergasted when I'm out and about and I hear, you know, there are still people who say, oh, it's this whole thing is a hoax. Well, it's not a hoax. 700,000 people died. California was shut down. You know, the long term health effects are real um, and statistically the the complications from vaccinations are, are minuscule. Um, and so, you know, the best thing we can do is to get to herd immunity and the governor's trying everything he can to encourage people, to cajole people, to get them there. And to critics who say that the money could and should be spent on on other perhaps better uh, things. Well, I think I think they're spending it across the board. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I don't think there's one strategy that's uh, let's put it this way. If there was one strategy that we all said was working 100 percent, we wouldn't need any of them. Um, so, uh, you know, I think everybody's just trying to do whatever we can to get to herd immunity. Um, you know, for me, I as soon as I was eligible, I got the vaccination. You know, it wasn't. It, it wasn't a it wasn't a question, but there, you know, there's been folks who have been told for a year and a half uh, that, you know, this whole thing was a hoax. Um, and remember, you know, Trump, President Trump 
got the vaccination in secret and didn't tell anybody. Um, you talk about a hypocrite and talk about failed leadership. You know, how many people follow that example who are going to die because he wasn't forthright about that? I mean, that to me, you know, uh, uh, that's just just uh, uh, just makes me sad. In keeping with this line of conversation, certainly you, you have many people who have uh, gone down the road of vaccination, either at, at least beginning the process, if not completing it outright. And there are others who simply flatly refuse to be vaccinated. Um, as the state reopens, we are seeing that a lot of businesses are, are basically left to police their own in terms of determining who is and who isn't vaccinated and how best to safely proceed. Uh, in a lot of cases, we're seeing that people are being left to the honor system where uh, signs are put in place that say, if you have been vaccinated, you need not wear a mask. If you haven't been vaccinated, you must continue to wear a mask in these public settings. But again, this is strictly on the honor system. And uh, so it leaves a lot of those who have been vaccinated feeling uneasy because there's no clear way to determine who has been vaccinated and who has not. There's also been discussion about vaccine passports, if you will. I'm wondering about your feelings on all of these situations. Well, let's be clear. The countries that have that instituted contact tracing in the beginning had a lower infection rate and we had a, a group, you know, a third of Americans who looked at that as a violation of their civil liberties and fought contact tracing efforts. Um, and now we had immediately upon the initiation of the vaccinations, you had, you know, crackpot governors like Ron DeSantis in Florida, you know, fighting, you know, the cruise ship things on, on vaccination passports. So it's, it's almost like the, anti-science fight du jour, you've got these, you know, whack jobs who, you know, and that's a technical term. And, I, you know, I, I can't believe that Florida elected Ron DeSantis to do anything other than, you know, uh, he, he shouldn't be governor um, because people aren't going to aren't going to survive his governorship because his leadership is so, so horrendous. Um, uh, it, it's just unfortunate. Um, uh, and what Gavin Newsom has tried to do is sort of thread the needle, is try to respect some folks' individual freedoms, but also create a system where, uh, you know, good, reasonable people uh, can come to a to a understanding that they're, you know, self-policing, they're vaccinated, um, and we can get back to normal. Um, it's a hard job. I mean, think of think of how diverse California is. Think of, you know, 40 million people um, trying to get them all to go as one and trying to be respectful of the dis disparate opinions. And I think the governor is doing a very good job doing that. Um, and I, you know, you see the, the infection rate way down. You see California leading the nation uh, once again. And, you know, I, you know, I, I don't have a problem with telling people I'm vaccinated. Um, I don't have a problem with I, I got on the elevator the other day and uh, one of my colleagues who wasn't vaccinated wanted to get on the elevator. And I said, if you're not vaccinated, you can't get on the elevator with me. Um, and, you know, I didn't have a problem making that making that statement because that person's selfishness was affecting my health. And that's what this is. This, this, this politicization of public health is selfish and frankly, you know, unbecoming of what American values are all about, which are good neighbor values. Well, recently, and, and we're speaking within the last few days uh, on the East Coast, they have begun some very, very large scale events. In fact, Madison Square Garden, I believe, just recently hosted a concert, first time in 15 months. Uh, and it was a packed house, but all those in attendance had to show proof of vaccination in order to gain entrance to the concert. 
which brings us back to here on the West Coast, where there has been discussion about a vaccine passport. And uh, certainly those that have already been vaccinated are, are perfectly OK with the uh, concept, whereas those who refuse to get the vaccine for various reasons seem to see even the idea of a passport as an infringement upon their rights. In fact, there have been uh, parallels or comparisons drawn to Nazi Germany of the 1940s. Um, to those people who cannot take the vaccine because of some type of underlying medical condition, uh, what do you say to everyone on the subject of the idea of being able to prove uh, at any time that you have been vaccinated? Well, first of all, let's take the comparisons to Nazi Germany. Those are offensive uh, and abhorrent uh, examples that people are using. And it, it, it just, there, there's no excuse to, to bring that into this conversation. And it's just, it's, it's just a, a, another example of, of, of a abhorrent simplification and, and it's just offensive. So I think we have to just, you know, the, 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 the Taylor greens of the world who do that, we just have to dismiss those, you know, horrible, associations. The folks who have a legitimate medical condition and a legitimate medical reason, that's a, that's a special case and it's a very narrow case. And so we do need to accommodate folks who have a, a, a medical issue. But for the rest of us, I personally don't have a problem uh, if I have to go to an event and I've gone to several events where the, 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 the flyer has come out and said, proof of vaccination must be on you when you go. I don't have a problem with that. Um, and I think, you know, folks who look at this as a public health issue and a good neighbor policy don't have a problem with it. It's those folks who have politicized it uh, that have the biggest challenge with it. And, and it's unfortunate. So I don't have a problem with showing or, or requiring a proof of vaccination to go to a public event. But are there plans to to do that moving forward here within the state or is that uh, really a, a bunch of worry about nothing at this point? Well, I don't think it's a bunch of worry about nothing. I think it's being left to the counties and to the individual organizations to decide. I think people are empowered to to require that. Um, and I think as the governor did early on, as he tried to empower counties and, you know, it's so funny, there's always been this, you know, try to do things on the local level approach and it's created a friction between the right and left. And here the governor tried to do that and empower locals. And and you saw the 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 sides flop flip flop on their their political perspective. But I think you know he's trying to walk that line. He's trying to encourage you know that good behavior. And I think you know uh, I just bought Dodger tickets for August to go to a game with my family. And uh, you know I don't know if I'm going to be required to take my vaccination card, but I, I will proudly take it with me. And if I need to show it to get in, I'm happy to show it. Is it fair or even reasonable to put the onus on business owners and operators to to guarantee the safety of the public in any particular situation? Now, that's a good question. You know, should should it be a statewide approach? You know, probably that's a better way to go about it. Um, and you may see that in the coming months. You may see more of that conversation. But I think, you know, we're all learning what normal is. We're all learning and taking baby steps, you know, starting out with small crowds to medium crowds to big crowds. I think we're going to learn along the way. And also we're going to see the numbers. You know, we're going to see the the infection rate and see the 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 overall vaccination rate. You know, the big question is if we get the, the vaccination rate up to 75, 80 percent, the, the need for the passports goes down. It's if it hovers in the 50 to 60 percent, it becomes a more of a challenge. So. I think they're right to focus on let's get as many people as possible vaccinated because the herd immunity is our best ally over the piece of paper. If we don't get to herd immunity, then I think you'll see a greater focus on proof of vaccination. Okay, well, a moment ago, you were talking about the governor and uh, the excellent job that uh, he has been doing in the face of the pandemic and with reopening of the state. Uh, governor Newsom is, of course, also the subject of a recall campaign. Uh, and I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind taking a few moments to give us your thoughts on that. Oh, I think I think the recall goes down. I think, you know, the the polling shows that 
California. It, it's it's a far different California than uh, when Gray Davis was recalled. Um, and I think the, the the low vaccination rate, or excuse me, the low infection rates that California is having, it's hard science. And you know, I think the governor is going to get the credit for that. Um, and I think with schools opening in the fall, um, I think he's in a good position to to withstand the recall. And I don't think it's going to be close. And to those who argue that the the money giveaways under the guise of vaccinations are really an attempt to buy uh, loyalty from from the constituency, uh, what, what do you say to that? Well, I, there, no matter what he does, he's going to get criticized. You know, there's an element. You know, back when I was on a, in the local government, we used to say, you know, there was 25 percent of the public that always said no. Um, you know, there's always going to be a percentage that's going to look to, to throw darts. And, and uh, you know, he's in a no win situation. Um, just that that's just the, 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 the deck of cards that he's been dealt. Um, and, I, you know, I don't I don't fault him for trying to be creative. Um, and I think he's going to withstand the, the recall. I think people have to go out and vote. I think they have to pay attention. Um, but I think at the end of the day, California's recognized that this was an unprecedented situation and he did the best he could. Well, as long as we have uh, wandered into the choppy waters of uh, recalls uh, or, or, or at least prospective recalls, we, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up uh, George Gascon and uh, the fact that he seems to be undermining a lot of the California justice system. Uh, I'm wondering if you would speak to that a little bit. Well, you know, uh, anyone who's been watching television or been affected by, you know, what's happened in, in our country in, in systemic racism uh, knows that these are complicated issues um, and knows that, uh, you know, right here in Pasadena, we've been touched by shootings. We've been touched by uh, police issues, reform issues. Um and, and it's a serious conversation. It's a serious effort. Um, the legislature, through the passage of SB2, their Senate passed SB2, which will bring more accountability to law enforcement. Everybody's trying. You know, I, I think with with the district attorney, he's got unique challenges in a sense that, uh, you know, is he trying to do too much too fast? Is, is, there, a, is there a middle ground? Um, you know, has he devi- deviated from the middle ground a little bit? Probably. Um, and I think that's where you're seeing the conversation. Um, but the need for uh, combating systemic racism is real. Um, the question is, can you do it in a way that respects the role of law enforcement and reimagine law enforcement, uh, reimagine how we do policing? Uh, and I think sometimes people... They, they, they displace or they un, unfairly trade those two issues. Um, there's dealing with systemic racism and economic disparity and uh, police violence. And then there's dealing with routine crime that most people expect law enforcement to deal with. And they're separate. And so what we have to do, in my opinion, is reimagine how we uh, police and how we bring community policing and how we bring uh, community folks together and how we like Pasadena has a has a a task force that they're empowering people to come in and talk about what do you want your law enforcement to to look like and feel like. And and Gascon isn't doing that piece of it. Um, He's making decisions more. Uh, by executive versus community wise. And I think that's where you see some of the frustration because there, there's two, two separate issues. Um, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do legislatively is look at how we recruit and train uh, police officers, reimagine that, you know, California is one of the few states in the country that doesn't require a uh, higher education, whether it's an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree to be a police officer. Um, we don't do the same training as other places. And so what I've been focusing on is, is raising the, the education level and the training and to come up with a curriculum on social work, on race relationships, on, on, on uh, psychology and other disciplines that would help 
uh, a young man or woman be a better police officer and a better community uh, partner. I'm working with the city of Glendale on a program to to bring social workers into drug treatment uh, approaches versus, you know, the the traditional law enforcement approach. So we have to reimagine policing and we have to respect the the tragedy of the George Floyd situation and the, the real impact of systemic racism. And then we have to recognize that our communities also want to be safe places uh, for those very same families. And so we have to do both. And I think what we're seeing is some folks are doing one or the other, but not both. Well, certainly community based policing is is an attempt to bring law enforcement into uh, greater contact with the the people that they are tasked with serving and protecting and and to to definitely uh, improve the sense of community. But uh, basically, punishment is uh, used as a deterrent to uh, not only take those people who have committed violent crimes off the streets, but but hopefully to discourage those who might even consider such an act uh, from actually taking the action. How effective can we be at deterring crime if, in fact, the, the person who's tasked with metering it out is basically gone soft on the entire scenario? Well, that's why I said separate tracks of this. There's the there's the the need for reform and then there's the need for some form of policing. And I, I don't think he's hitting the sweet spot between the two. And, you know, based on how you you described it, I mean, it, it's it's one of the challenges. It's, you know, and you take a county as large as Los Angeles County that has different uh, different problems and different pieces of it. Um, and it's a challenge. And, and I don't think he's hitting both both pieces with the same uh, focus that he should. But that's that's just my that's just my opinion. Well, and, and again, as I mentioned at the, the top of this segment, uh, there is a- By the way, we have the other problem with the sheriff who, you know, who who ran on a platform of trying to be a reformer um, and then, you know, came in and ha- hasn't done anything. Uh, on, on those issues and has antagonized everybody. So, you know, it's it, it it's to me that's that's even more frustrating in in his approach to to that job because uh, he is you know he he's fighting with everybody except Fox News. Well, there is a, a momentum gathering now to begin a recall campaign of George Gascon as well, uh, especially led by many of the victims of violent crimes who see his refusal or his, his unilateral uh, dictation that uh, that no one can seek enhancements on any of the the charges that uh, are that uh, committers of crime are brought up on. Uh, Again, there, there is now an attempted movement to start a recall campaign. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I don't I don't fault, you know, it's one of those things where you if you walk in somebody's shoes, you learn a lot. I mean, you know, I'm blessed that I haven't been victimized by a violent crime, um, but I don't I don't I, I don't harbor any ill will towards folks who have been victimized by violent crime. Um, having a passionate perspective on it, um, you know, I, I don't have, you know, that's what they're supposed to do. That's the American discourse. You know, if you have a legitimate issue, you're supposed to bring it forward. And, you know, we have to look at reforms and we have to be sensitive to those folks who have been touched um, on all sides of this equation. So, you know, I think it'll, as it progresses, you'll see a greater conversation and, and more input. You know, I haven't been following that that issue as much as I've been following the governor, obviously I'm in Sacramento uh, dealing with, with the, the reforms that we're trying to do on the systemic racism versus what uh, the DA has been doing in LA County. A moment ago, you, you brought up uh, during the discussion about George Escon, you, you mentioned the, the LA County Sheriff. Um, as a politician yourself, do, do you feel that politics is becoming nothing but extremism? Uh, it, it seems, to be uh, highly polarized at this point where officials are either on one side or the other, but there is no middle ground anymore. Is, is that a fair assessment? And what are your thoughts on that? 
You know, as somebody who who has tried to be thoughtful, you know, during my career and tried to to look at the big picture, um, you know, it's it, it's it, so much of politics has become about us against them. I think Clinton had a great quote. He used to say every every two years we we debate us against them. And he said the issue is there really is no them. There's only us, you know. We've lost this notion that what affects one of us affects all of us. We've we've lost this this idea that out of the conversation you get better results. Um, so much of the polarization has been around a social agenda versus uh, uh, you know tangible issues. Um, uh, it, it's it's been just you know we had four years of a president who whose entire campaign was demonizing. Uh, folks, whether it was talking about immigrants as, you know, again, I'm the grandson of immigrants. I mean, my grandparents came to this country to, to proudly to, to, to be Americans and, and create a new life for their children and their grandchildren. Um, but we had a president who demonized immigrants. We had a, a president who, you know, when there was anti-Semitism in Charlottesville, refused to condemn it. Um, we had a president who told the Proud Boys to stand down and went and condemned the Proud Boys. And now, you know, they, you know, did an insurrection on the Capitol. You know, uh, we have had expert after expert talk about, you know, the dangers of domestic terrorism. You know, we have a, you know, we have certain governors around the country who want to be president who think that the key to their their victory is to polarize Americans. Um, and yeah, is it up to the rhetoric? Uh, you know, we're seeing in Washington today, you know, uh, attempts to, make voting more democratic or is going to get defeated because there are people who want to make, you know, voting less democratic. Um, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. It's, it's, it's not what the greatest generation fought world war two about. Um, it's not what, you know, folks who came back from Vietnam, uh, talked about in, in their perspective and how they changed the political discourse. Um, it's people who have changed the political discourse, exacerbating difference and hate versus love and common. Um, and I think we get we get way too caught up in it. Well, up to now, we've talked uh, about quite a variety of subjects and many of them on a national level. Uh, let's bring the conversation a little more local and perhaps to uh, topics that are a little more near and dear to you uh some of the work that you have been doing here in the state of california um i, I guess we could start off with uh, i guess it's state bill 457 which deals with calpers and uh employee pensions i'm wondering if you would tell us a little bit about that bill well i said i was waiting for you to get to some of the some of the legislation we got there you got you 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 were you were going off um but uh, now, you know, I represent the largest Armenian population of any legislator in the country. Um, about 150,000 uh, Armenian Americans are in my district. And, you know, many of them uh, work for the Glendale Unified School District or the Glendale City, Glendale City. And to have their pensions be invested in the government of Turkey, uh, you know, which committed the first genocide of the 20th century, killing, murdering 1.5 million of their ancestors, uh, think about and then investing in that country uh, with your hard-earned uh, wages. Uh, I just think that's unacceptable. And so I'm trying to get CalPERS and CalSTRS to divest from holdings in Turkey, government holdings, uh, Turkish banks. And last week, uh, Cal, uh, CalSTRS, the Teachers Retirement Fund, uh, internally uh, elevated a divestment strategy. And so we've actually taken them out of the bill to reward their, their good behavior. Uh, their good judgment. And so we're hoping PERS will do the same thing in the next coming weeks, follow suit. Um, but uh, so that's what that bill was designed is to give Glendale employees the ability to not have their wages invested in a country that killed their ancestors. Well, that certainly makes a lot of sense. Uh, you also have uh, worked on several bills that uh, relate to education. Could you tell uh, our viewers at home a little bit about those? Yeah, that I, I, that's really what got me to run for office in the first place is I was a 38 year old father of a young daughter and wanted to make sure that the city council and the school district cooperated and went to the went to the assembly and focused on education. And I do a lot of gun reform, too. But again, it's, you know, raising the gun purchase age 
to 21 helps save some lives of teenagers. But uh, I've got some mental health and dyslexia bills this year. Um, you talk about a social justice issue. There was a study out of Texas where seven out of 10 inmates were dyslexic. Um, and we know that if you're a suburban child and you, your parents have means, you can, you know, and sensitivity, know when your child is struggling in the first or second grade with dyslexia and reading issues, and you can take them to the best pediatrician. But there's a lot of families out there that don't have the ability uh, to get their kids screened for dyslexia. And so we're trying to mandate dyslexia screening in kindergarten, first and second grade, so we can get intervention early. It's four times cheaper to intervene in the early grades, and it's three times easier to intervene in the earlier grades than it is uh, to intervene with dyslexia in the, in the eighth grade. Um, and as a dyslexic myself, uh, I didn't start to get any any intervention till the eighth grade. Um, and so uh, we have a bill to bring that. And then on mental health as well, uh, Right now, mental health and physical health are not treated the same way under education code. So if you're home with a cold, uh, that's an approved absence. But if you're home with depression and anxiety, that's not an approved absence. And think about a 15-year-old uh, student who's worried about being accommodated when they go back to school because they they had a major uh, depression uh, or, or anxiety attack or bipolar or other forms of mental health. Uh, think about wondering if that's going to be even considered a, an approved absence. And so we're changing the law on that. We're also requiring half of all school personnel to be trained in a form of mental health first aid. You know, we train folks on CPR, uh, but we should also train teachers and school staff to understand the risk factors in suicide prevention. Uh, a father called into a hearing the other day talking about how his 14-year-old daughter turned in her journal as an English assignment, got an A on the assignment, and then a couple of weeks later took her own life. And the warning signs of suicide were in that journal, but the teacher wasn't trained to see them. And the father was not mad at the teacher because he said the teacher wasn't trained. But had that teacher been trained to see the warning signs of, of that daughter's dealing with mental health and depression issues that led to her suicide, she could have got help. And so we want to train 50% of all school personnel uh, on seeing the warning signs of suicide and other forms of mental health issues. And then finally, we have a bill to create a curriculum on mental health. Uh, student, young people are the best advocates for themselves and for their peers. And so I want every student through their K-12 experience to take a class in elementary school, middle school, and high school, uh, age appropriate class on mental health. So they can be advocates for themselves and for their friends. Um, and so we're I'm pushing those those initiatives this year. A couple of years ago, I put the suicide prevention hotline on all student IDs. Um, and I did that to a there's a cohort of students who might need that number. And B, it helps other students more freely talk about mental health issues and get it out of the shadows. When, you know, when my brother, my brother took his own life um, a decade ago, uh, so many people came up to and talked to me about mental health issues and suicide in their family. Once I had joined the club, they felt comfortable talking to me about it. And it just emphasized to me how deep in the shadows the mental health conversation is and how important it is for us to get it out of the shadows. Because if we bring it to the forefront, we can get kids and parent families help that they need and take the stigma off of it. So those are some of the things that I try to do. Well, and if I can bring the conversation super local for just a moment, you also were involved in several uh, bits of legislation revolving around the 710 freeway, uh, including being the author of, I believe, SB7, which ultimately brought an end to the, the possibility of the 710 freeway. Is that correct? Absolutely. After six decades, uh, when I got elected, it was actually the day that I got sworn into the state Senate. I sat down with the secretary of transportation and we negotiated sort of a peaceful uh, detente agreement to to end the the 710 freeway tunnel threat and part of it was to let metro take its action then let the EIR certified and then the final piece was once the environmental impact report was certified with a different alternative than the tunnel then I would do legislation to officially uh, uh, kill the tunnel which I was able to do and help the nonprofits um buy their buy their properties and then give the city of Pasadena the ability to uh, uh, negotiate to to get the stub. And believe it or not, there's somebody doing a bill to try to that will actually hurt Pasadena's efforts to get the stub. And I want Pasadena to get control over that stub so they can do some open space, some affordable housing and some parks and trans, you know, do some mobility around it. And so 
Uh, the, the folks who started that battle 60 years ago deserve all of our respect because they fought Caltrans tooth and nail for s- six decades. And we, you know, I was there at the end to, to the last 20 years uh, fighting that battle first to get the cost benefit analysis to the forefront and bring some more transparency to the conversation. And then uh, to be in a room to negotiate the, the final end of the, the tunnel uh, I'm very proud of that, and but also want to thank those folks in their 80s and 90s who started the battle 60 years ago. But again, as you mentioned, the, the battle's not quite over yet because there is still uh, an issue over returning all the properties that were annexed uh, under eminent domain uh, to to normal use of some kind. Is that correct? Yeah, we're trying, and we're trying to protect the the the, the long term tenants in the corridor. Uh, we want to move them up on the priority list um, ahead of the nonprofits. So a lot of what you know my office has done on a constituent services uh, back in the assembly and in the Senate is to try to help the the tenants as much as possible. I did a freeze on rents a few years ago for those folks in the low income uh, program, so the state couldn't raise their rents. Um, and I want to get as many of those existing tenants to be homeowners as possible. I'm working closely with the city of South Pasadena um, uh, on uh, on helping them. Pasadena thus far just wants to be left alone. And so I'm respecting Pasadena's uh, request to, to let them, they wanna work directly with Caltrans. Um, SB7 gave them the ability to do that. And so I, I haven't included them in the new bill because they don't wanna be in the new bill. And you, know, you have to work in concert with your local governments. South Pass has two different subcommittees. One, we're going to try a legislative solution and one, we're going to try an administrative solution. So I try to work very closely with my local governments um, on solutions that that work for them and then work for the state. Well, something else that's uh, uh, sort of been heavily uh, discussed in the media recently, of course, is the uptick in violence. We, we've seen a lot of that, um, not just here, but across the country. And a lot of it has been attributed to people being cooped up for the last 15 months in the, in a state of lockdown. Uh, but uh, obviously, the violence has become a, a bigger issue. Uh, and you have also been involved in some legislation concerning firearms. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, uh, I was getting some hate <laughs> on Facebook because of it uh, today. So no, I uh, I raised the gun purchase age in California. So you have to be 21 to purchase a gun. Uh, it used to be just for handguns, but you know most of the mass shootings are done by long guns. So I raised the purchase age to 21. I banned open carry in, in California. If you remember back when I was in the assembly, a bunch of about 150 gun enthusiasts took the goal line to Old Town just so they could open carry their guns in protest to my legislation and we were able to get the governor to sign that uh, I've done the safe storage of, of guns. So if you're at home and your gun falls into a prohibited person's hands, you're going to be liable. Um, uh, and so I got governor Newsom to sign the safe storage legislation. And this year I've got a bill germane to what happened in Pasadena uh, where that gentleman left the car and was shot and the family's arguing whether there was a gun or not gun. The police say he had a gun and the family says he didn't have a gun. And under legislation that passed last year, the attorney general can do an independent investigation if an unarmed person is shot uh, and killed by a police officer. But it didn't cover a situation where the the presence of a gun was in dispute. And so my bill amends last year's bill to say that if there's a credible dispute over whether there was a gun, the attorney general can do an independent investigation. And that's directly related to what happened in Pasadena. And then the Poway shooting in the synagogue uh, the perpetrator was able to purchase a gun with a, a, a not invalid hunting license. Uh, and I want the DOJ to determine the validity of hunting licenses so we don't have teenagers getting their hands on a gun through an invalid uh, uh, hunting license. So those are some of the things that I've done in relation to, uh, to, to gun control. And as you know, there's a big segment of our population that doesn't want any any restraints on guns at all. And, you know, I believe the Second Amendment and our founders gave us the ability to, to regulate uh, guns. It's different what you do in your own home versus what you do on Main Street. Um, and I think we have the right to, to regulate Main Street. And, and recently we have seen California's assault 
uh, weapons ban uh, basically be sidelined uh, in a court decision. Uh, now, technically, that's been placed on hold uh, for further litigation. But but how does that affect you and, and the bills that you have championed to this point? Well, we actually have a bill to ban a certain uh, centerfire rifles that goes into effect uh, next month, a uh, bill that I did uh, two years ago. Uh, I'm waiting for the DOJ to figure out what we need legislatively to fix uh, the court decision. Uh, as you said, today it was it was put on hold. Uh, but I've been talking to the Department of Justice when the when the first decision came out. We're waiting to see how the courts sort of set the table. And if we need further legislation to enhance California's approach, uh, I've already talked to the DOJ about authoring that legislation. So uh, I'm just waiting. I'm going to take my lead from the Department of Justice. We have a new attorney general. uh, So I'm going to take my lead from them. Um, But there may be some legislative fixes that we need to do. But we have to wait to see what the final court decision is. But like everybody else, I'm disappointed that uh, that uh, lower court decision uh, uh, invalidated uh, a longstanding California law that's been effective. Well, we're coming to the closing minutes of the show, and I'd like to to take this opportunity to to uh, have your final thoughts on anything that you might like to discuss. It perhaps something you'd like to say to or hear from your constituents. Well, you know, my office is is in Glendale and in San Dimas. Uh, I have a great, I have the best staff in the state of California. We we really have been helping thousands of people with their EDD cases with. Uh, other forms of casework. So if you if you need help from from my office, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to the Glendale office or the San Dimas office. Um, I think I tell my colleagues I have the best district in the state of California, um, and you know I believe that from the heart. Um, and I love what I do, and I love the conversation and the interaction. Uh, I'm easy to get to, uh, and I try to go to as many community events as I can. Um, and we're here to serve the, the good people of the 25th State Senate District. Uh, this district is largely focused on public education, which is why legislatively I do so much there. But we've got great community colleges in Pasadena City College, Glendale and Citrus are housed in the district. And there's 11 uh, four-year universities in, in, this, in the district as well, including the five Claremont Colleges and Caltech and, and, and Woodbury. Um, and so... I really try to help where I can just average people, you know, seek and and thrive in the American dream and have healthy families. And so uh, thanks for letting me come talk a little bit about uh, about that today. And I enjoyed enjoyed our conversation. As one last question uh, for for the constituency, if there is a, a someone who wants to reach out to you and 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 speak with you, perhaps on a on a slightly more one to one level, is that possible? And how would they go about doing that? Well, they can call my district office, which is 818-409-0400. Um, and uh, see if my staff can help them first. And if they need to talk to me, they make a request. And, you know, I try to meet with as many people as I can, given 24 hours of the day. Uh, I try to meet with everybody if I can. So don't Absolutely. be shocked. Certainly very understandable, as I know that the, the work of government is, is very, very busy, to say the least, and it seems to be getting more busy all the time. Senator Portentino, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us this evening. We truly appreciate it. Uh, to our viewers at home, if there are topics you would like to see addressed on our program, you can email them to us at arroyolive at pasadenamedia.org, and we may include them in a future broadcast. Until next time, this has been Arroyo Live. I'm Joe Carbonetta. Thank you for watching. And good night.